King George V and Queen Mary, in June 1921, set out through the streets of Belfast to open the first Parliament of Northern Ireland. Or rather, the first Parliament of six counties of Northern Ireland, where Ulster Protestants are in a majority, and which, by an act of the British Parliament, had been given their own form of home rule, apart from the rest of Ireland. What was to happen to the rest of Ireland was still, in June 1921, undecided. But at least with their King and Queen there to open Parliament, Ulster Protestants could feel under their leader James Craig a secure future for their own new provincial state. The next month, July 1921, the British government called a truce in the campaign they'd been fighting in the rest of Ireland. And later that year, they signed a treaty with nationalist Irishmen, who they'd been calling terrorists and murderers a few months back. In that treaty, the six counties as a whole were given the right to opt out of the new nationalist Ireland's rule, a right of which they were to be quick to avail themselves. But there was a clause in that treaty which provided for a boundary commission to adjust the border of Northern Ireland in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants. Now, the Ulster Protestants, always insecure as a minority in the whole of Ireland, and particularly so now that most of Ireland was no longer under British rule, the Ulster Protestants understandably became more determined than ever to establish for themselves a new security. While the Catholic minority in the six counties felt it wouldn't be long before the northern state, undermined by the Boundary Commission, proved unworkable. At that time, we thought it was uh, a very, very temporary thing, and if we stayed out, that the House of Cards would crumble. But uh, uh, thanks to uh, a lot of British pounds and so on, the system was kept, uh, uh, kept in being here. What made Northern Protestants, and particularly those in County Tyrone, who were a minority of the population there, particularly anxious about their future security, was this clause in the treaty which called for adjustment of the border in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants. Of the six counties of Northern Ireland, it was not only Tyrone which had a Catholic and nationalist majority, but also County Fermanagh and indeed a considerable section of South Armagh. If the Boundary Commission were to decide that large areas of this sort should be transferred to the new Irish Free State, then the new Northern Ireland state could indeed be expected to crumble. Protestant Unionist leaders vehemently rejected the Boundary Commission and all its works. Partly through their determination, and partly through the Free State's preoccupation with its own civil war, the Boundary Commission eventually came to nothing. But the six-county state had been founded in a deep sense of insecurity, which explains much of its subsequent character. Even traffic policemen were to be armed against any external or internal threat. And top priority was given to the new Royal Ulster Constabulary, replacing here the old Royal Irish Constabulary. James Craig inspected B Special Reserves. Indeed, the first six months of the new state in 1922 had been marked by sectarian rioting in Belfast and elsewhere, much of which expressed the Protestant and Unionist sense of insecurity. 93 Protestants were killed and 171 Catholics. Thousands of Catholic refugees streamed south across the border to take refuge in the Free State. In 1932, a new parliament building at Stormont symbolised Northern Ireland's by then apparently solid foundation, and its opening by the Prince of Wales linked that foundation unquestioningly with Britain. The King charges me to convey to you his Majesty's wishes for your welfare and success. 
And it is his earnest prayer that you will meet all those difficulties which confront the whole world, as well as your own special problems, with the courage, tenacity, loyalty, and devotion which have always characterized the men of Northern Ireland and have made them famous in the annals of the Empire. In the name and on behalf of his Majesty the King, I declare this building to be open. Britain easily forgot that there were those in Northern Ireland who didn't find it easy to cheer. The familiar pattern of rioting took a momentarily unusual turn in 1932 when Catholic and Protestant unemployed littered the streets with debris in a joint protest. and the RUC were to be mobilized again three years later in their traditional role of guardians of the state when sectarian-based political rioting broke out between Catholic nationalists and Protestant unionists. In a state in which the Prime Minister Sir James Craig gladly proclaimed that he was prouder to be Grand Master of the Orange Order than of being Prime Minister, Attacks on Orangemen on the 12th of July were easily seen as threats to the very fibre of the state and were dealt with by police and Protestant mobs accordingly. Those opposed to the Orangemen's way of thinking felt as they'd felt since the state was founded, isolated, and in the state's eyes of secondary consideration. In August 1939, the launching of the aircraft carrier Formidable symbolized the all-important part which Northern Ireland was about to play for the United Kingdom in the war with Germany. As Minister of Commerce for Northern Ireland, I'm paying a visit to London to see what more can be done towards using Northern Ireland's industrial resources and manpower in the war effort. As you know, we are part of the United Kingdom. It was about the only thing the British public did know about Northern Ireland. Ulster's great shipping industry is busier than ever. 100% in the war, Northern Ireland makes a fine contribution to the Allied effort. The famous linen industry is also working far beyond its peacetime maximum capacity. Because Ulster men are wealthier than the Southern Irish, more enterprising, better businessmen, they refuse to be governed by Dublin. Ulster will not allow the economic tail to wag the dog. Hera, with its population of little more than three millions, not only turns a blind eye and a deaf ear to the world war, but is apparently indifferent to what might happen to her if the Germans won. Such a ludicrously patronizing, even contemptuous English attitude to Hera, or Ireland, was not only offensive, but dangerous. It displayed complete ignorance of the fact that about one-third of the population of Northern Ireland, the Catholic and predominantly nationalist third, felt closer emotional ties with ERA or Ireland than with the United Kingdom. One wartime experience ERA did momentarily share with Northern Ireland. German bombers carried out heavy raids on Belfast in the spring of 1941 and fire engines from Dublin crossed the border to help deal with the flames and clear the debris. Friendly help for neighbours in trouble was one way of looking at this. But of course, Dublin officially regarded damaged Belfast and the whole of the North as an inseparable part of all Ireland anyway. And tens of thousands of nationally minded Irishmen and women lived in Belfast centre. And for all the spirit of the British war effort, in which many thousands of those nationally-minded Irishmen and women joined, there were a few extreme Republicans who never gave up hope of one day destroying the Northern Ireland state by violence. Here in Ireland you had the Republican movement continuously picking away, if you like. There was no really organised campaign as we know it today. They kept picking away and striking whenever it was possible. He had a tremendous British presence, of course, during the war, and uh, it made things very difficult. 
But they did keep picking away and picking away and picking away. It's you were one of those who picked away? I was, yeah. I was involved in one of these situations where shots were to be fired over the RUC. We fired shots over a patrol car. A policeman was shot dead. Eight people were arrested, there were two guards and six men. Six men were sentenced to death. Uh, one of the six was executed. You were sentenced to death? I was, yeah. Uh, three days before the execution, five of us were reprieved. The sentence had been commuted to uh, penal servitude for life. Ulster Protestants still had good reason to be apprehensive about the security of their state. But the IRA had been temporarily eclipsed by greater events. When, in 1945, the surrendered German submarine fleet was brought into London Derry, it was Northern Ireland's part in victory that held the British public's mind and won Winston Churchill's acclaim. Belfast and London Derry had a great share in the war. And to them we owe our route across the Atlantic Ocean, which alone enabled us to dispense with cork and Kinsale. Royal visits acknowledging Northern Ireland's loyalty were reminders for the Protestant and Unionist establishment of Northern Ireland of that link with Britain on which the security of their state was based. When Unionists entertained their Queen, it didn't seem to occur to her advisers that the Orangemen's Lambeg drums were offensive to about a third of the population of Northern Ireland. Some, though technically the Queen's subjects, didn't see themselves as such. I have the greatest respect for Her Britannic Majesty, but if I am asked to acknowledge her as Queen of Ireland or any part thereof, I cannot do so. I would normally avoid a function at which her toast would be honored, not because I wish to give her any disrespect, but because I would be untrue to my allegiance as a citizen of the Irish Republic. I have good Protestant friends too, you know. We knock around together, go to dances and all that kind of thing. But I wish the heavens they'd stop banging them drums. The banging of the drums was an occasional irritant, but there were permanent ones. Social aspects of the state which discriminated particularly against Catholics and nationalists and particularly against poor Catholics and nationalists. Northern Ireland between the wars had suffered from chronic poverty. Income per head was around three-fifths what it was in Britain. Public health was worse than in any other comparable area in Britain. Housing was deplorable. In 1938, nearly half of those who died between the ages of 15 and 25 died of tuberculosis. In this society, such privileges could be obtained had been jealously prized and, correspondingly, bitterly resented. And by nature of the state's reason for existence, privilege was for the Protestants and resentment for the Catholics. Unemployment in the 30s had averaged 25% of the insured population and was still high after the war. And though Catholics were a minority of the population, they felt themselves a disproportionate section of the unemployed. A conviction that there was discrimination against Catholics over jobs led to much bitterness. Discrimination in, in jobs is particularly obvious in um, the local authorities, in places like um, Cookstown, Dungannon and Derry, where it's almost impossible for a Catholic to get a, a job such as surveyor or sanitary official or any of these jobs. Uh, they're kept for the one site. I applied for a job in the catering department of Queen's University and it was the catering officer's secretary who took the interview. And, um, the first question you asked me was my address, and the second question was my religion. 
Now, I don't think this should be so in applying for any job, anywhere. One should not be asked to religion. Discrimination over housing was equally bitterly felt. Large Catholic families like these in Fintona, County Tyrone in the 50s, couldn't get new houses, although these often only had outside water. While Fintona council houses were given to individual Protestants living alone. It was in the city of London Derry that discrimination against Catholics over housing seemed most blatant. It reached this extraordinary position in the last few years of the corporation that the allocation of houses was entirely at the discretion of the man who happened to be mayor. The mayor and the mayor alone decided who got a house and where and when. And the mayor was always a Protestant. How could this happen? in a city where Catholics were a majority of well over 60% of the population. Catholics were even a majority of the voters. They were, it's true, a smaller majority of the voters than they were of the total population, partly because Catholics had more children who, of course, were not voters, but also partly because one man did not have one vote in local elections. In local elections, you had a vote only if you were the occupier of a house or premises of a certain value. If you were a businessman, though, with a limited company, you could nominate up to six more votes depending on the value of your premises. Now, it must be said that this was also the case in the United Kingdom as a whole until 1945, the argument being that those who paid high rates were entitled to have a greater say in how those rates were spent but now it only applied to Northern Ireland. And on the whole, the system did tend to discriminate against Catholics there. Still, to get back to Londonderry, where Catholics were in 1967, for example, a majority of the voters. 14,429 Catholic voters and 8,781 Protestant voters. How come then that Londonderry consistently returned as it did a Protestant and Unionist majority in the corporation. The city was divided into three wards, a North Ward, a Waterside Ward, and a South Ward. The North Ward was created to give a Protestant and Unionist majority. The Waterside Ward to give a Protestant and Unionist majority. Into the South Ward were crammed most of the Catholic voters in the city to give an enormous Catholic and nationalist majority there. Thus there were two Protestant and Unionist wards to one Catholic and nationalist. The North Ward gave eight Protestant and Unionist seats. The Waterside Ward four Protestant and Unionist seats. And the South Ward eight Catholic and nationalist seats. 12 Protestant and Unionist seats to 8 Catholic and Nationalists. So-called gerrymandering, which from a majority of Catholic and Nationalist voters, produced a majority of Protestant and Unionist seats. In 1967, in County Tyrone, where Catholics and Nationalists were in a majority, the same sort of thing happened. A Catholic and Nationalist majority in the population produced a Protestant and Unionist majority of seats in the County Council. And look how this sort of thing affected jobs. In County Fermanagh, Catholics also formed a majority of the population. But look at how these senior council posts were distributed. Or the jobs as school bus drivers. Or go back to Londonderry again, where, still in 1967, in spite of a Catholic majority among voters, there was for so long a Protestant corporation. This was how it distributed its jobs generally. Why this discrimination against Catholics? They set out to destroy Ulster as a, as a, as a country and to unite that with the rest of Ireland, make United Ireland. And I was determined to resist that at all costs. Very many ordinary Protestants shared that view, and their determination to hold what they had, come weal, come woe, was symbolized in the orange parades every 12th of July.
it was by playing on Catholic resentment at discrimination by the Unionist establishment that extreme Republicans hoped still to drive the British crown from the six counties. And in 1956, the IRA launched a new campaign against the state. The training was pretty severe, for example, in the Dublin area where we had, uh, we, we were lucky in that training facilities were uh, right at our doorstep with the Dublin mountains. And um, every weekend for, for that entire period, that six months almost, we were in the Dublin mountains training with weapons and uh, actually going through sometimes murderous long marches, as it were, uh, getting physically fit for the campaign that was to come. It was highly successful in that 90% of the targets um, picked were hit. Um, not all successfully, or as the planners would have desired. They were mainly uh, road, rail, telephone communications, uh, a few attacks on British Army installations, a few RUC stations attacked in an attempt to get arms and equipment and so forth. We turn now to a very serious situation within our own country, within the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland. Now, the activity of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, as it's called, over the past few years has been pretty irregular. From time to time, there have been acts of violence on the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. Dimbleby asked Northern Ireland's Prime Minister, Lord Brookborough, to explain what was happening. A few months ago, the attacks were uh, deployed against the military installations with the very stupid idea that by so doing, uh, they could defeat the British Army and uh, that we Ulster folk would go like sheep into a country that we consider a foreign country. They're not members of the British Commonwealth. Now, what is this IRA, this Irish Republican Army? Well, the IRA, I, I'm not in their councils. I yes, can't give you a very detailed account of it. But the IRA, really the militant side of Sinn Féin. By March of, of 57, that was three months after the beginning of the campaign, that, militarily speaking, we had lost the initiative. Um, there was a very simple method of attack uh, in the initial stages. Um, it was that a column would operate on the old guerrilla bases, which worked successfully during the uh, War of Independence in places like Cork and Tipperary and that. And it worked successfully then because the, um, you had widespread support among the people and you were working and, and operating in your own home area. Uh, these two factors were missing in the Northern Campaign and that most of us uh, did, weren't familiar with the area and uh, support was, while it was good, it was limited. The one big mistake I'd say was that we didn't have the support of the ordinary people and without the support of the ordinary people you're doomed to failure. Lacking enough support from the people, the IRA called a ceasefire. The IRA actually said in their ceasefire statement the campaign failed because the Catholic community in the North didn't give us their support. The Catholic community didn't give the IRA campaign, that 56 to 62 campaign, their support. And I, I met Brookborough about this time. He was then Prime Minister. And I said to him on an occasion in Fermanagh, I said, Sir, wouldn't this be a marvelous time for you or somebody in your government to recognize this fact that the Catholic community didn't support the IRA. Surely this is the time to introduce Roman Catholics into the party, to, to encourage them to join as members, and to become members in Stormont. He didn't want to know. He didn't want to know. The fact is that the Roman Catholic, by and large, is out to destroy Ulster and bring it into a united Ireland. The Protestant is out to maintain it, uh, uh, Northern Ireland's position within the, Uni within the United Kingdom. We defeated the IRA, but brethren, this is no time for losing vigilance. The people who say that there's no need for vigilance any longer are burying their heads in the sand. Brian Faulkner was an Orangeman, Minister of Commerce in the 1960s, who was doing much to stimulate the industrial development of Northern Ireland, encouraging new firms and creating new jobs. 
but he as yet saw little wrong with the political and social features of the province. I don't know what the political and social features are that you're thinking about, but quite definitely we are creating uh, a modern outlook. We have created a modern outlook, and well, I think it must be obvious as you go around the country. But for all the 160 new firms and 55,000 new jobs created by the mid-1960s, the only thing modern about the outlook for the poor in the Catholic minority was that they received the considerable social benefits of Britain's welfare state, none of which were received by their fellow Irishmen in the South. These social benefits were often a very positive incentive to accept the Northern Ireland state rather than hanker for Irish unity. But for those already inspired by nationalist ideology, they didn't do away with the sense of discrimination. I was aware uh, mostly of what would be termed class discrimination. I was born, Protestants are always telling me, you know, that I'm one of the ungrateful poor. I was reared and educated on the welfare state, uh, and I'm supposed to be grateful for that. They taught me how to speak and think. Uh, my memories of it are not of gratitude. My memories are of those social security people coming out and going through your dresser and counting the uh, number of vests you had and examining your socks to see if the hole was actually big enough for you to be uh, afforded more money to buy more socks. Uh, the whole, my whole memory of it is of humiliation, not of gratitude. But an attempt to change the climate in which Catholics lived was being made by the new Prime Minister of the 1960s, Captain Terence O'Neill, here visiting a Catholic convent girls' school. I was going to see a girl at one moment. <laughs> no luck. Sister, how do you feel about the Prime Minister visiting your school? We were delighted to have Captain O'Neill with us today. We feel it is a great honour for the school. As far as I know, it is the first time that he has visited a convent grammar school in Northern Ireland. We certainly hope it won't be the last. A meeting between O'Neill and the Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland, Sean Le Mass, seemed for extreme unionists to confirm the dire political consequences of softness towards Roman Catholicism. Le Mas had been in the old IRA, and this was the first meeting between prime ministers of the two Irish states for 40 years. How politically dangerous was it for O'Neill to try and change the climate of unionist thinking after 40 years? Well, it's always impossible to tell, isn't it, uh, before any action, uh, what danger you're running. We discussed this, actually, during our meeting, which of us would get into the most trouble. I said I would, and he said he would. He did get into a certain amount of trouble during the first six weeks, but nothing to the trouble that I got into uh, later on. O'Neill's attempt to soften the bigoted face of Ulster Unionism met an onslaught from the Reverend Ian Paisley, who saw any gesture of friendship towards the Catholic community in Ireland as a potential threat to the security of the state. Captain O'Neill recently said that the south of Ireland was a very beautiful young lady and that he was very glad to talk to her over the head. Of course, Captain O'Neill's a married man and he shouldn't be talking over the hedge to any young lady. But I want to say this evening that we don't look upon the south of Ireland as a beautiful young lady. We look upon the south of Ireland as the refuge for the murderers of policemen and law enforcement officers and Protestants who will not bow the knee to the Romish bill. But a third of the population of the North looked on the south of Ireland as their motherland. And when in the mid-1960s a grouping of old nationalist leaders and new young radically minded people formed a civil rights association to end discrimination in jobs and housing, this movement began to take on a nationalist, though non-violent, tinge. A civil rights march was planned for Derry on October the 5th, 1968, but banned by Stormont. There was a grouping in Derry of, uh, around the Northern Ireland Labour Party, a radical young grouping, people like McCann, Eamon McCann. Uh, there was a strong Republican grouping, and then there were the old people like Eddie McAteer. 
who declared that if the Civil Rights Association postponed the march, they would march anyway. Any person who wishes to parade or hold a meeting is quite at liberty to do so provided he holds it other than in an area specified in the order led by the minister. We are the people of Derry and we intend marching in our city. We welcome you, sir. The Royal Ulster Constabulary went into action. After this, Northern Ireland would never be the same again. The People's Democracy, a radical offshoot of the civil rights movement, organized a march from Belfast to Derry at the beginning of January 1969. The long march from Belfast to Derry mm. was a perfectly legal march and entitled to police protection. But I think the government took the position that they would allow the students to march and afford them really no protection so that they would learn the hard way what was likely to happen by over-exercising their democratic rights. The march took four days. It was escorted by police, who also, not without some reason, blocked its way from time to time to divert the marchers, who were mainly young Catholic radicals, prudently round Protestant towns or villages in order to avoid provocation and possible retaliation. It was when, on the 4th of January 1969, the marchers reached Burntollet Bridge, a few miles from Londonderry, that the real trouble started. Protestant opponents were waiting for them above the road. Yes. A good possibility of some stones being thrown. Some people may be hurt somewhat. However, police have said they are quite prepared to get us through this obstacle. And if we all keep in very close formation on the right-hand side of the road, then we should be OK. The sort of geography of the area was that this region on our right was a high bank where we were looking up at people. Then we came to a point where it dipped down onto the same level as the road. And just as we came to that point, a, a shower of rocks began to hail down on the marchers. Some police went up among the stone throwers, but made little attempt to stop them. People just huddled together and kept on walking. And when we came to the point where the fields leveled with the road, literally hundreds of people just rushed through this gap in the hedges and they were carrying cudgels with nails in them, and they waded into the march. These people were all wearing large white armbands, who were very crudely made, like bits of sheet tied around their arm. Now, the police made no attempt to apprehend these people, but simply prevented the students from escaping to the left, so that we were cornered with no way to go only forward or backwards. Uh, most of the march went forward, and some people escaped into the fields. The police, who were supposed to be protecting the marchers, now abandoned them to their assailants. None of them were masked, and they were all carrying these weapons, and yet the police were arresting the students, dragging students and throwing them into police wagons. And something like 84 students were arrested on that demonstration, and uh, something in the region of 50 or 60 were injured. But after that, no single person was ever charged with attacking anybody at Burntollet Bridge, not one. 
Three, in fact, were charged and fined. Later that evening, the marchers came angrily into Derry and before long were attacking the police. And the police went into the bog side to reply. Because we have lost confidence in the forces of law and order, and as a protest against what they have done to the people of this area, you have taken, taken the upholding of law and order in this area into your own hands. That means that it's your job and your responsibility to protect both persons and property in this area. The law and order in this district is the responsibility of the residents of this district. The police are not allowed into this area. This is our form of protest against what they did here last weekend. Londonderry, where the majority population on a head count is nationalist. Why was no effort made to meet the demand, legitimate demand, of people of the area before the people got onto the streets, before we had those terrible scenes? This is where it all went wrong. As the year progressed, the civil rights movement began to gather strength. On the 12th of August, the Apprentice Boys held their traditional march in Londonderry, celebrating the raising of the siege of Derry, beset by Catholic armies in 1689. Riot has gathered and began to throw stones at the police. Police understandably retaliated. <laughs> Leaders of the civil rights movement did their best to contain violence, but the situation was soon out of anyone's control. Police suffered casualties and retaliated. Disciplining an obstreperous population, dangerously keen on civil rights, now took precedence over strict law and order. Unionist resentment at the gathering strength of the civil rights movement was getting out of hand, and the police and B specials were not preventing it from doing so. The fact that they saw the police last night accompanied by Paisleyites uh, coming into the Bogside area means that the people are scared that the area will be torn to pieces by the police when they come in. And elderly women uh, are in virtue of hysterics and therefore they're determined to fight to keep them out. And as I say, it's not only the siege of the Bogside, but the collapse of the RUC. And uh, there certainly isn't any possibility of the Stormont government uh, quenching what's going on at the moment. Well, it's pretty frightening in Dungannon at the moment on Wednesday night. The bee specials just ran amok with Sten guns. They drove through the Catholic area and let them off indiscriminately through people's houses, through their windows, shot people down without asking questions at all. It's a question of now shooting the questions that come later. If you're in a predominantly Catholic area, you're not safe anymore. And on the night of the 14th of August, the same thing was repeated in Belfast itself. Perhaps to try and take some of the heat off Derry, Catholic rioters took to the streets. Protestant mobs, backed up in some cases by the RUC and B specials, invaded Catholic areas of the city. It was a very frightening night, certainly the most frightening night uh, of my lifetime. And it started off with uh, sporadic rioting on the Falls Road. The police then withdrew. Uh, reports came through that hostile uh, mobs were getting, gathering on the Shankill Road. Hostile Protestant mobs? Protestant mobs, extremist Protestant mobs. Uh, the B specials had been mobilised. Uh, and then suddenly uh, these Shoreland armoured cars came racing up the Falls Road, uh, stopping every so often and firing these very heavy calibre machine guns into built up areas, flats and down streets and the like. Did they fire without being fired at? Well, certainly I was on uh, 
I was in my constituency, which was the, took in the bottom of the Falls Road in the Divis Plas area, and I could see no shooting taking place from where I was. Uh, I was later told in the course of the night that there was some shooting taking place from uh, a school there just opposite uh, Percy Street, known as St Congal School, and I, I subsequently found out that there was two or three men with guns uh, there, but I think that was the sum total of the guns on the Catholic side, and they came in at a very late stage of, of the night, about two o'clock in the morning, whereas the shooting broke out at around 11. Uh, there was absolutely, despite popular belief, no IRA men. Uh, there had been a number of old IRA men who had really no respect in that community. And one of the interesting points in the aftermath of the attacks on the Falls Road that night was a contempt which the Catholic community had for the IRA, and it was not unsurprising to see on gable walls, IRA, I ran away, uh, because they felt that whatever number, and we're talking about a small number there were, did not protect them. And we had nothing. No shooting at all from your side? No shooting at all whatsoever from our side because we hadn't got nothing to shoot back with. All we had was stones and a wee couple of petrol phones we had. That was all we had. Some people went south of the border to try and get arms. Myself and others came down here looking for any means of protection from any source. Didn't matter what the source was. To try and protect ourselves, the people in Belfast, Derry and other riot centres in the north against guns from B-specials, Paisleyettes, etc. There were no weapons in the north. I, I viewed the situation that morning. Most of my constituency was in flames. Streets of houses had been burnt. There had been a number of people killed. And I decided there and then to travel to Dublin to see the then Irish Prime Minister, Jack Lynch. And I met him before a cabinet meeting here in Dublin. And I asked him, uh, what was, would he send troops to Belfast in the advent of, uh, in the advent of British troops, not coming in, and uh, if British troops didn't come in, I explained the situation to him, I felt that we would need arms to protect the Catholic people, uh, because there could be a, a massacre. But the intervention of the Irish government was not required. The British government had already sent troops to keep order in Derry on the night of the 14th of August. On the night of the 15th of August, they went into Belfast. British troops were now in position in the streets of Belfast and Londonderry to keep the peace between the two communities. The British Parliament had been ultimately responsible for this society in the half century of the state's existence. For the first time in half a century, it had intervened to assert that responsibility. I'm very pleased that they are here, because if they hadn't been here, I wouldn't have been here. It was a terrible time we had those two nights. Terrible. And you feel safer now? This Certainly, I do feel quite happy about it. Quite happy about it. I was up with the soldiers the first one Sunday morning they were here, five o'clock in the morning. You went to see them? I went up and gave them their tea, their breakfast. Some people say that the soldiers haven't been very polite, that they've been rude to people. No, I never found that, really. How would you feel if the soldiers went away? Would you think it's time they could go away yet? Oh, no, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't dream them going away. Not for a long time yet. Sure, you're never sure here, no. There you are, love. That's for after your lunch or after your dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Not everyone in the world's got soldiers standing on his street. I mean, they feel quite chuffed with it, because they're a bit too young to understand why we're there. But they seem pleased enough we're there. Give them something to say hello to in the morning. I don't think they're scared of, you know, they're not shy of us because they come up and talk to us, play around with our webbing. In fact, sometimes they're a nuisance, you know, pulling us to bits. Within 18 months, those same children were throwing stones at British troops who were having to defend themselves. Petrol bombs now, instead of cups of tea. Why? What had gone wrong? This is the fact that when the British troops first came in, in 69, that they were received with open arms by the people, the majority of the people. I, I felt, as a Republican at that time, that we didn't have any great opportunity of striking against the Brits. 
But it is fair to say that, or right to say, that the Brits developed the situation themselves. Whilst they claimed to have come in as the peacekeepers in 69, they were seen by the ordinary people to become the aggressor. Now, there were obviously people who saw the opportunity there, and while this honeymoon period continued with the British Army, they sought to manipulate people and to try and build an organisation, and out of this particular period grew the provisional IRA. When British troops were welcomed into Catholic, nationalist, republican areas, using these terms interchangeably, uh, it set off a counter-reaction in Protestant areas. And uh, if you remember, there was sporadic routing broke out on the Shank Road where an RUC man was killed. And I think that the British government looked at the situation, that they wanted to um, maintain a balance, as it were, between the two communities. They were virtually embarrassed at the reception I think the British troops got. So they felt that in order to, as it were, quieten fears on the Protestant side, they had to lean on the Catholic side. So British troops then started uh, what was called cordon and search, cordoning off an area and searching the houses. And this gave rise to, uh, to resentment, and it later grew. And, of course, uh, it was greatly heightened by the Falls curfew. The curfew in the Lower Falls in 1970 was a crucial uh, uh, period in, in, in on Ireland's history in relation to the growth of the provisional IRA. Uh, there had been a belief that there were a small number of IRA men operating in the Lower Falls, and they chose to use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And I remember coming out of that area that particular night, I just managed to get out before the curfew was imposed, when there was saturation of the area with tear gas and total surrounding of the area in a cordon of steel by the army. And in fact, that action on that particular night so alienated the entire uh, Catholic community, which I, I would stress before that had not been anti-army, but so alienated the Catholic community to the extent that the provisionals were able to represent themselves as the defenders of the Catholic community. I think that if the British had not have been as clumsy in their dealing with the situation in, in, in areas like West Belfast, uh, that the IRA would not uh, have gone on the, the offensive. It's something that developed, I'd say, round about the middle of 1970. You could see the change coming. You could see the, if you like, the attitude of the people, the ordinary people in the street, changing towards the presence of the British Army. And so that is the opportunity and the ideal opportune, opportune time to strike at the Brits. At the beginning of February 1971, the first British soldier was killed by the provisional IRA. So it was decided by the leadership of the Republican movement that we would have to retaliate and uh, when the retaliation started it was then decided that we would carry on a war of independence. We were going to break the link with England once and for all. In March 1971, from this pub outside Belfast, three soldiers were enticed while drinking off duty and shot in cold blood in the road outside. It was perhaps not surprising, though not excusable, that when soldiers from the same regiment as the men murdered in March made arrests in May 1971, their methods should have been as rough as they were. It was also not surprising that when the ordinary Catholic people in the streets saw this sort of thing going on, they should change in their attitude to the British Army. The army, in many Catholic eyes, had taken over from the B Specials, who'd now been disbanded. But dissatisfied with the army's efforts, many Protestants wanted the B Specials back. No disrespect to the army, but the army does not. The army hasn't got a clue. One of our association members has been murdered. And the Prime Minister says that they're closing in on the terrorists, but I think the terrorists are closing in on us. We demand the B-Specials to be recalled because we believe that these B-Specials know 
where these men are, they know their names, they know who they are, and they will not be allowed to come into these areas. Just two weeks ago, a bomb was left in my own hall. How is uh, the security forces allowing this? And many more of our members is going to be murdered, and all we hear is that they're closing in on the terrorists. There's no security. There was a sense of crisis among many unionists, already dismayed by reforms to please the civil rights movement, and particularly by the disarming of the police and the disbandment of the B-specials. The reforming Prime Minister Terence O'Neill had had to resign before hardline pressure, even before the events of August 1969. He'd been replaced by an equally well-meaning, but even less magnetic upper-class orange Ulsterman, Major Chichester Clark. But early in March 1971, the Unionist Party replaced Chichester Clark too by someone they'd good reason to expect would be of sterner stuff. The one time fairly die hard Unionist Brian Faulkner. In connection with the meeting I've just left, I'm very pleased indeed that the party rallied round me the way it did uh, this morning. No Prime Minister could get off to a more encouraging start. <laughs> Another political change had been the formation in August 1970 of the anti-unionist Social Democratic and Labour Party under its leader, Jerry Fitt. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Rejecting Don't worry about it. totally the violence of the IRA, the SDLP sought eventual Irish unity, but in the meantime, the cure for Northern Ireland's ills in political reform. The British government must recognise that there is no military answer to the problems here in Northern Ireland. That political election must be taken. But as terrorism by the IRA increased and the bombing of civilian premises was added to the attacks on the army, it was the need for a military or at least a security solution that seemed paramount. And the Prime Minister, Brian Faulkner, who was also Minister for Home Affairs, took action accordingly. I have had to conclude that the ordinary law cannot deal comprehensively or quickly enough with such ruthless viciousness. I have therefore decided, after weighing all the relevant considerations, including the views of the security authorities, and after consultation with Her Majesty's government in the United Kingdom last Thursday, to exercise where necessary the powers of detention and internment vested in me as Minister of Home Affairs. Nearly 300 were arrested and interned without trial. By the end of the year, it was to be nearly double that number. The very word internment helped the IRA by stirring nationalist memories of 1920 and 1921. And once again, this had the exact same effect of reinforcing Catholic support uh, behind the IRA and allowed the IRA the opportunity to set themselves up as defenders of the Catholic community. And it was out of that response which, which we are now unfortunately faced with this terrible campaign of terror which has slaughtered many innocent people, uh, men and women in Northern Ireland. And I, I in retrospect, would, would certainly argue that if the British government had have approached the situation politically rather than military, then we might well not have played into the hands of the provisional IRA who were quick to seize the opportunities presented them. Confrontation between the army and Catholic and nationalist mobs indulging in street violence to protest against internment became the order of the day. In protest against internment, the IRA sought to present this as a plain nationalist struggle. I would like to make an appeal to our fellow Irish men and women in the South to rally now to our support. We need your help in this struggle that is going on at the present time. The fight in the North here is as much your fight as it is ours. This is your country as much as ours. But to persuade even Irishmen in the North that this was a pure patriotic struggle, the IRA often had to resort to barbaric treatment of those Catholics they considered traitors. Horrific methods, too, were used by the IRA's opponents in reply. A Catholic pub, McGurk's Bar, was blown up by the Protestant loyalist Ulster Volunteer Force. Everyone in Northern Ireland has known for some considerable time since the outbreak of the present troubles 
that one day there would be an explosion which would take with it the lives of many innocent people. This, in fact, has happened, and it has happened in my constituency, where many men, women, and indeed children have lost their lives last night. There's a sense of grief and numbness all throughout this constituency. But there was always also anger, and anger among those Catholic nationalists who rejected the IRA could easily be fanned into resentment that Britain should be in Ireland at all. In January 1972, a demonstration protesting against internment was led towards the internment camp at McGilligan by the SDLP leader, John Hume. Rubber bullets were fired at the crowd almost at once. What authority that you're holding us back here from walking so, yeah, on the this street? is a prohibited area. You're not allowed in a prohibited area, and it goes three miles under out what sea. law? Would you ask those men not to stop firing rubber bullets? At the woman, please. They will not. They'll stop it, provided you keep away from the war. And don't try to enter this prohibited area. Under what law is it prohibited, or under what authority is it prohibited? Can you tell me? It's been prohibited by the police and by the government. Well, the, the police tell me. The police tell me that it's you that is in command here, not them. I am police and military here. This is a military area. And under authority of the government, this has been decreed a prohibited area. Yeah, and are you proud of the way your men have treated this crowd today? This crowd has tried to come in a prohibited area. Uh, you, you, as a member of parliament, have tried to stop them. And you, you shot the, them with rubber bullets and gas. The crowd was marching over there. The leaders were going to speak to you before we even got there. You opened fire. That's right. And fire was open after it came through the wall. No, it was not. No, it was not. Fire was open as the crowd was coming across the beach. Mr. Hume, I'm not here to enter an argument with you. No, I what am. Happened? I'm not here either. But uh, I wouldn't be very proud of the conduct of your men today. They're a crowd of people, and they're totally unarmed people, as you can see for yourself. Jim, you, if you lead all people away, then we'll go away too. Yeah, but we want to march in there. I want to march in there. Why not? It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. You can't prohibit it. It's been prohibited by your government. Who's government? The government of Northern Ireland. Not our government. And that's why you're here, because it's not our government. A week later, the Civil Rights Association in Derry held their own protest against internment. It was an illegal march. Many civil rights reforms had already gone through. One man was to have one vote. Derry Corporation had been dissolved. But now there was internment. To contain this illegal march, the army had put up barricades preventing the marchers from reaching certain areas. Rioters were met by tear gas and rubber bullets at first. Against rubber bullets, there was some protection. The army decided to go over to the offensive, and they moved into the bog side to make arrests. There came a moment when they thought they were being fired at, and they fired back. came too late. Targets had already been hit.
appearing to be dead. There are the three in that Saracen car. There are two men lying at the end of this block of flats. There's another man at least very close to being dead. There's one, there are two others up there. I'm told that there, there are some more in these flats here that I haven't seen yet. I would say there are probably about four dead at this moment. Uh, I don't know what those are doing, whether they're alive or dead, but they seem to be very dead and they're thrown in as if they were dead meat. We did not know at that stage whether they were dead or whether they were wounded. And a vehicle went forward under the very real threat of fire because we were still being fired at at that stage. When we're fired at, we must protect ourselves. We shouldn't have to do it, but they put us in a position where we can do no other. <laughs> Even people taking dead and dying to the ambulances felt it necessary to keep their hands raised. Thirteen were killed and thirteen wounded on this bloody Sunday. None of the dead or wounded were later found to have handled a firearm or a bomb. A number of people, including children and women, were marched away by the army as if it had really been a battle that had been fought. Just over a month later, the IRA blew up the Abercorn restaurant in the centre of Belfast at a time when it was crowded with Saturday shoppers. Two women were killed and 130 injured, many of them horribly mutilated. We understand that there was a minute's warning given to the police um, who didn't have time to pass it on at all. An independent unionist went to see the IRA. My first talks with the provisionals were in fact in March on the day after the Abercorn disaster, arranged a short notice in Dublin on a Sunday. The Abercorn bomb went off on a Saturday. That left a tremendous mark on me, that bomb. And my children, a daughter, knew well two girls who were very badly injured. I won't mention the, the injuries now. And I felt, and she said to me, Dad, somebody's got to talk to them. So I think I was probably the first to actually engage in talks. Now, those talks obviously failed. I, my plea was to stop the killing of civilians. If I was a part of your movement, I would be saying exactly the same thing. It's counterproductive. What the hell are you trying to do? So, but I'm not part of you. I'm against you, everything you stand for. But surely you must see what good did yesterday afternoon do you? The killing and the maiming of those young people. And my plea with the provisionals was to change the course of their tactics. One voice did say at a meeting, we've gone too far, but I, they saw it this way, we're fighting a war and this entails, oh, regrettably, the killing of, of innocent civilians. Fighting a ruthless and often foul war with no mandate from anyone but themselves, fighting it without anything like enough support from the people of Ireland as a whole or even of the nationalist community in the North to win it, but fighting it with just enough support from nationalists in the North who'd never been enthusiastic about the Northern Ireland state and who now felt harassed by the British Army, just enough support to be able to keep on fighting it. A stalemate, but a stalemate that was going from bad to worse. And now, in March 1972, the British government decided to take over direct rule themselves. The Stormont Parliament was suspended while a search was made for some improved political formula for the state. Ulster loyalists, who were, after all, the democratic majority in the North, reacted in traditional manner. They marched in protest in their thousands to the building of their now suspended parliament, where they were greeted by their suspended prime minister, Brian Faulkner. We understand absolutely the feelings which have persuaded you to come out to parliament buildings today, and that not only do we understand your feelings, but, my friends, we share them. Ulster loyalism had always had an independent side. 
and we feel that we, in our endeavors to provide just government in Ulster, have been betrayed from London. And that independent unionist side was now asserting itself through an Ulster Defence Association, which at times indulged in indiscriminate sectarian action against Catholics. The two tons of petrol and the torch them into the, the premises and then ignited them. Then I, 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 I came running down because I knew my, my parents were in the house and tried to get them out. And when I was coming down, they started shooting at me, but there was only blank, blank on them starting pistols or something, you know, that didn't do me any harm, you know. But the UDA could be as ruthless as the IRA they opposed. My children and my parents have suffered some fantastic, like I'm innocent people who do nothing. The only thing we believe in God, that's the only thing we have. In the vacuum created by the suspension of Stormont, the UDA, many thousands strong and with arms they didn't choose to parade, were emerging as a real force in Ulster politics. And the vacuum did indeed look to ordinary people more and more like a vacuum, one in which desolation and despair flourished easily. A vacuum which it was difficult to believe was part of the United Kingdom. A vacuum, but one in which there was no peace. On the 21st of July, 1972, the IRA set off 26 bomb explosions in Belfast, killing 11 people and injuring 130, again mutilating many of them terribly. Could this ever be going to end? This, after all, was now the direct affair of the United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland. What could the government do? Heath, together with the government of the Irish Republic and Brian Faulkner of Northern Ireland to implement an arrangement to share power in Northern Ireland with the SDLP under Jerry Fitt. At the same time, to meet what was called an Irish dimension, a Council of Ireland was to be set up. Catholic members of the SDLP, like Paddy Devlin, while keeping their aim of a united Ireland to be won only by consent, were for the first time to share power at Stormont on behalf of the Catholic minority. The Catholic Austin Curry was to be in charge of housing, sitting together with former Unionist ministers in the Cabinet of Northern Ireland. Jerry Fitt was to be the Deputy Chief Executive opposite Brian Faulkner. What particularly worried Faulkner's fellow Unionists was the Sunningdale proposal for a Council of Ireland. It's a Council of Ireland which will enable uh, the Dublin government to cooperate with the Belfast government on matters of mutual concern. But it's a Council of Ireland which has absolutely no constitutional responsibilities either in Northern Ireland or in the Irish Republic. Unionists rallied to the old cause. The election result showed clearly no confidence in Faulkner or Sunningdale. What have the people of Ulster said? They have said, first of all, to Mr. Faulkner and his cronies, we will have nothing to do with enforced power sharing in any undemocratic government in Stormont. And they have said, with a, a voice of authority, Mr. Faulkner, the time has come for you to go. The 
exact time when Faulkner went was three months later, when a body known as the Ulster Workers' Council began a political strike against power sharing and Sunningdale. The centre of Belfast was paralysed by barricades and all transport and normal activity brought to a halt. Power stations had to be taken over by the army. The strike, which had been organised with direct involvement of the UDA, received widespread support from the Protestant Unionist population. The British government capitulated and Sunningdale was abandoned. And the Ulster Workers' Council had the last word. Well, we started off to, uh, to run a stoppage. Uh...